Well, good morning, everyone. Good now it's afternoon, I should say. We passed the 12 o'clock hour. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Gary Painter. I direct the USC Price Center for Social Innovation. And this is um, our first of our speaker series here in 2019. So welcome. Um, today we're really excited to have a social entrepreneur named Sal Garlic with us. Um, let me tell you a, a few things about him for those of you who didn't read the uh, bio in detail. Um, but Sal, Gall, uh, Sal is the founder of C and CEO of Unleash, which is a mobile training platform for frontline workers in low-skill, low-wage jobs. Unleash seeks to connect workers to the future economy, one where automation is shifting the nature of work. So it's a really critical issue for us. Um, I heard a statistic this morning, uh, and there's some really important critical natures around, uh, of who are most likely to be automated, which was a pretty powerful statistic. Um, and it varies by race and class in ways that you know, are, are really important for us to consider as we're thinking about the future of work. Um, before that, Sal was the founder and CEO of Think Impact, an award-winning global immersion experience for college and graduate students working on social innovation in Kenya, Ghana, Rwanda, South Africa, and Panama, and he sold that organization in 2018. Sal was a Truman Scholar, um, for those of you who know that. So we, I know we have the undergraduate social innovation class here in the room, so hopefully some of you are thinking about applying for that scholarship. Um, he was an Inc. Magazine 30 Under 30 entrepreneur, a top nine young foreign policy, uh, foreign policy leader, um, and many, many, many other accolades. This year, we're very excited to have him here at USC. He's the 2018-19 Social Entrepreneur in Residence at the USC Marshall School of Business. So please join me in welcoming Saul Golick to our conversation today. Thanks so much for having me. I want to start by just saying, while I am not a Trojan, I am married to a Trojan, which is effectively the same thing because it soon consumes your whole life and your babies are only wearing Trojan gear and you know this is how it is. So it's a thrill for me to be here. It's been a real privilege to be the social entrepreneur in residence. Um, I started last October uh, out of the Brittingham Social Enterprise Lab at Bridge Hall. Um, and my being here is in some way a message to all the students, alumni, and, and folks who are engaged with USC that I'm a resource to you. So whatever we talk about here, let's continue the conversation. Um, I'm having a total blast. I told my wife that, you know, I come here, I sit with students um, on Thursdays, and it's just pure fun, and there's no stress. I said, it's not a job. And she said, we should probably unpack that. Why does a job have to have stress? And I said, well, I am an entrepreneur, so it's kind of the only way I know. Um, but I, I do uh, absolutely love meeting with students and talking about your careers and your ventures. And today I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something with an audience larger than I anticipated, uh, a little bit different. So I'll, I'll give you some background. I'll provide context. I'll talk about where I come from, what I do, what I've done, what I've seen. Um, and then if it makes sense, and I'm, this, is a, this is a high risk venture here. I would like to throw up on the easel a, a theory, a model that I'm working on, which helps explain enterprise impact decision making, right? And expand on that and see the, where the role of policy might be. And I want you guys, if we get to this, to completely rip it apart, right? So this is an opportunity for you to see a little bit into how I think about social entrepreneurship. It's going to surprise you. I'm not. I'm not going to tell you that social entrepreneurship will solve all the world's problems. That's not what I believe, and I don't think uh, really anybody should. Um, and I'll unpack it, and we'll start talking about it, but we'll start at the, at the sort of more fo most focused uh, enterprise level, and then we'll get up to public policy. OK, without further introduction, I am trying to watch my time if I'm going to split this. So let's see if we can even pull this off. Um, so. I've been doing something in the space of, in the impact space for my entire working life um, and all the way going back to high school. So I started an organization in high school that became a nonprofit when I went to college out at Johns Hopkins. And I focused on developing um, a community of students who would fight poverty. 
I wanted to raise funds and awareness for poverty in Africa. And I had a personal connection. My parents were from South Africa. I had been down there um, many times as a kid, usually just inside the walls of Johannesburg, not really getting a sense of poverty in its true form. Uh, but a confluence of a couple events happened that were really powerful for me. One, I went to a public inner city public high school in Denver, Colorado, which uh, meant that it was a really diverse population. It was um, majority minority. So that was interesting for me. Um, then, which, which opened my eyes. I had gone to a Jewish day school all my life, went to a big public high school. I was tiny, I was afraid, I didn't know what I was doing. And um, frankly, it was, it was kind of lucky that that freshman year of, of high school, going all the way back in time, I was in a government class. And I started to think about, you know, what's my role in society broadly, right? The world can't just be a nice little buttoned up community. And so I started thinking about that. And then through high school, I got really excited about political science, policy, government. And uh, then 9-11 happened my senior year. And with that, I got drawn into what's America's role in the global community? What are we doing when we project our power around the world, right? So that kind of started to intrigue me. And I had started an organization called the Student Movement for Real Change, which ended up doing some work raising funds first for Afghan children after 9-11. And then uh, started when I went down to South Africa with my family. I saw poverty um, when I was a senior in rural villages in what are, what are called homelands, or during the apartheid regime were called Bantustans, in rural South Africa, where people were, were Africans, which were, you know, 90% of the population were put on the 21% of the land that was deemed crappiest in the country. Okay, so what that meant is they took this entire majority population and isolated them to land that would not grow crop, right? And so poverty follows, right? You don't create opportunity out of that. And so it really struck me because people were living on a couple bucks a day. They were living without access to running water, you know, the story. And so then I decided to build a school. I, I just committed and pledged to raise 10,000 bucks to build a school. So that's what got me onto this journey. To say that that is what actually happened going forward and where I've been um, is, is like the understatement of the century. It's been a totally meandering journey. Uh, and, and what I want to do is give you a snapshot into that journey uh, and tell you why I think what the topic of this conversation is about, which is social enterprise and public policy, is probably the most important conversation that we as a society need to be having. Okay? So right now, uh, I've worn, as I stand here before you, I have worn both for-profit and non-profit hats. I went to undergrad and studied international relations, went to graduate school and studied um, international relations at SICE and in public, you know, focusing on sort of public policy and understanding Washington, D.C., where I lived for uh, seven years. And I was really interested in what would make the greatest impact for the greatest number. How do we change the world, right? How to Change the World was a famous book that David Bornstein wrote that was all about, you know, you can do it, right? You can just get up and go and change the world. And it's inspiring. And social entrepreneurship gives a platform for people to get excited and motivated to make that kind of difference. And I was one of those people. And so when I was in college and in grad school, I had this little nonprofit that I had incorporated, which was raising funds and awareness for poverty in Africa, starting college chapters around the country to raise money. And then it came to, you know, what was my job going to be after grad school? And I jumped into my nonprofit on a full-time basis. And our first work was bringing students to live and work in rural villages, and we placed them in South Africa. And so the idea was, you know, go and live with the community, run day camps, build libraries, these kinds of things. And from that moment, when you're in South Africa and you're trying to make a difference, you should be asking a million hard questions. Like, what is going on here, right? So first of all, there's this legacy of apartheid where people are living marginalized even today. There are teachers who were raised during apartheid and were never given a proper education who are now responsible for teaching the next generation, right? There are market failures where access to a simple taxi that gets you to the local market just doesn't happen because it costs too much 
for people to drive the extra mile, what's called the last mile. And so you start to ask these questions and you start to say, well, what's my role? What am I doing here, right? And what is going on? And these questions really pushed me, right? I, I couldn't understand, first of all, South Africa is one of the most complex socioeconomic environments I've ever been in the world. Um, but I couldn't sort of find a right answer and I was frustrated. I was interacting with government, but I was also interacting with, um, with the private sector. And I was thinking there's got to be a solution. And so I started to get really excited about market-based solutions to poverty, right? Maybe business can solve these problems. Maybe the market failure is really what we need to be focusing on. Um, and so I, I put a lot of attention there. And what I took was a program that was sending students on immersion you know, experiences in rural South Africa and turned it into essentially a program to bring students to help local communities develop micro enterprises, right? So we would bring them out, we built a curriculum which was based on what we discuss, describe as an asset-based ba asset mindset, which is a focus on what exists, like what you have, not what you need, and really started to explore, okay, if we go to a community and we ask people what skills they have, what institutions exist, what resources, natural or otherwise, are available, you build from there. That's entrepreneurship, it's resourcefulness. So you create new enterprises, you connect people, you have productive dialogues, you train people, and new businesses can be born. And I was super excited about this, and we started building the curriculum and started learning about what it takes to create business. And by the end of 2010, I had been doing that so much that I felt like I shouldn't be running that out of a nonprofit organization. We were at that point 50% donor funded, uh, we had some earned income, and then 50% earned income. And we were saying, okay, now what? Should we live in the market? Should we be a for-profit if we're creating for-profits? Let's be consistent, let's test this. Let's be a true for-profit social enterprise. So in 2011, I did something untraditional. I bought out my own nonprofit. Um, and that was the scariest thing at that point in my life that I had ever done because I didn't know what that really meant. I didn't understand the consequences of raising equity and what, what debt means if you're a nonprofit and you're starting a new business, you have no money, blah, blah. It was all over the place. But I did it and it was really, really amazing because I learned a lot about business, right? I learned how to build a business. Um, I did right by the nonprofit entirely. I ended up giving somebody else the nonprofit. They started an uh, organization that focused on providing like social entrepreneurship skill career building opportunities called uh, Cafe Impact. Um, and there's like videos online and you can check them out. And with the for-profit, I, I bought it out and we called it Think, and, and the, the nonprofit was called Think Impact. And then as a for-profit, we kept the brand. So we were Think Impact Company. And Think Impact for the next many years was growing as a business. And it was exciting. I mean, over the next sort of three, four years, we helped start about 200 micro enterprises in South Africa. We went to Kenya, Ghana, Rwanda, Panama. We started working all over the world. We were sending college and grad students on these immersion experiences. And we were really making an impact in people's lives, right? And, and the, the buyout from the nonprofit got us some notoriety. We had a bit of a platform. The Inc. thing came through. New York Times ran a small business case study on my decision. They called it the social entrepreneur's quandary to be for-profit or non-profit. That is the question, right? And these were the debates that were sort of all over the social entrepreneurship space. And it was a lot of fun to be part of that discussion. Um, but there were really complicated choices going on that I didn't even fully appreciate. And that's what I want to get into a little bit later when we get into sort of the academic, you know, debate side of this conversation. And I really do want to open it up um, to all of you guys. But there were a few things kind of bothering me, right? So I was building a business that was taking students and building microenterprises, but it was engaging thousands of people, not hundreds of thousands of people, certainly not millions of people. And if you read anything about the data around poverty, you know that Really, there are three billion people who are living on a couple, three, four bucks a day. The quality of life disparity is egregious. And I just saw a stat, you know, a current stat the other day, 
something like if you're making $32,000 a year or more, you are in the top 10% of earners in the world, right? That's the poverty line here, right? That's tough here. That's a lot of money. So we know the problems are huge and we know that the market is not really serving everybody. And there are a lot of reasons why. So I was still struggling with that scale question. And the social entrepreneurship space, actually for about a decade, has been obsessed with this word scale, right? Will your enterprise scale? Will it actually change the world? And when you think about scaled corporations, I mean, Apple went to scale, Coke went to scale. These things went to scale. They sold a product, they got to everybody. Google went to scale. And then in the social enterprise space, not to make this conversation way too complicated, and you can obviously see there are a lot of sides to this coin, what happened was technology was booming and people were really excited about tech solutions to everything, right? So there was a lot of technology thinking infused in the social enterprise space. And not surprisingly, there was a huge bustling social enterprise community out of the Bay Area, right? And people were thinking about what could be a scalable solution and they were not necessarily super critical about the difference between, you know, goods and service goods and services that require a lot of time and effort and investment compared to tech solutions that can scale immediately, right? And so people were looking for this this I want to say holy grail of really everything, right? They wanted to make money. They wanted to make an impact and they wanted to do it for everyone, right? That's what social entrepreneurship became committed to. And something interesting, and I'll, I'll give you a little bit more of my background that'll sort of lead you here, but something interesting, really interesting happened in the next several years. The language of social entrepreneurship became the language of everybody, right? If you go to McKinsey, they talk about social entrepreneurship. Deloitte talks about social entrepreneurship, right? Every university, actually I have to give USC credit, they were at the forefront of social entrepreneurship, but now, Hundreds of universities have centers for social entrepreneurship. And that's not a bad thing. I am a social entrepreneur. But it became mainstream, it became cool, and it became the answer. And I think that what I want to do in this room is have an honest conversation about where social entrepreneurship is effective and where it really isn't effective. Because what is happening, and I just, I, you know, if you want to read a great recent book on this, uh, um, there's a book called Winners Take All that talks about uh, sort of where we are as a society and it captures a lot of my thinking and, and I thought it was really powerful. And, it, and, and the core belief that I have is that social entrepreneurship is fundamentally good when it serves a specific population and we need to be innovative and creative and we need to be solving problems for people's lives. We have to keep pushing there but we cannot let that be a distraction from public policy decision making. We cannot let social entrepreneurship continue and persist without attention being paid to the government institutions that are actually failing society and are getting worse, right? That's our challenge though, because when you talk to a traditional entrepreneur, I would venture to guess in my conversations in the entrepreneurship crowd, most don't really care about policy unless it affects their business, right? They're worried about taxation. They're worried about difficulty with regulations. They're not thinking about the broader picture. And so we have an opportunity, we have an opening in social entrepreneurship to find a way to take the social enterprise experience where we're trying to achieve a double bottom line, right? Impact and profit and bring that into the conversation about public policy and where there are just total failures of public policy where social enterprise is not going to actually solve the real problem, and where there aren't failures of public policy, there are opportunities for public policy to enhance what social enterprise is doing, right? So I'm going to get into that a little bit more, but let me jump back to some more background. So I started building this for-profit social enterprise, and from there I started thinking a lot about scale. What was I going to do to create a scalable solution? And Technology was the obvious choice. And so what I did is I started building an app, right? As we do, I started building an app inside of Think Impact 
that was really based on a mobile solution to deliver skill building, right? Because I was sending students on these programs and they were going through a curriculum and they were doing a really great job and they were learning a lot. Their lives, lives were changed when they go on these programs. It's a life-changing experience to spend eight weeks in rural Kenya. It is for me, it is for everybody. And especially if you're productive during that time and you're really working with the culture and you're listening and you're looking at what people have and not what they lack and you're not seeing everybody as a, as a charity case, but you're seeing everybody as an unbelievable partner in development. These are the things that really drive awesome, exciting, inspiring you know, transformation. And so I wanted to bring that skill building experience to everyone, right? And so what I did is I built a mobile first application because I had this kind of core belief that, you know, this was back in 2013, I started working on the idea that basically smartphones would penetrate the whole world, just like cell phones had. It was kind of funny, just a sidebar. It was funny in the late, you know, 2000s, how people would write these articles about how, you know, Africa was seeing you know, even more rapid cell phone adoption and, and purchasing rates than anywhere on earth. Like it was a surprise. Like how are these people able to afford cell phones? Not to mention that like billions of dollars are spent in Africa every year, right? So people were like, wow, they're using phones. And I'm like, wow, they really like to talk to each other like everybody else, <laughs> right? For some reason, Safaricom, Orange, MTN, you know, people there know that people are people everywhere. And it is idiotic, frankly, that anybody would write an article with surprise that cell phones grew fast in Africa. That's silliness. So following that same logic, I was like, well, smartphones are going to penetrate the world too. And sure enough, and, and it happens faster than you think. When I was, um, you know, early on with, with dumb phones thinking about this, uh, I didn't even think, you know, there, was, there, there were two things going on. There was like regular business, and this is a total sidebar. There was regular business selling cell phones and what have you. And then there were nonprofits that were going to save the world, right? And one was called One Laptop Per Child, right? And One Laptop Per Child created what they were pitching as a $100 laptop, which by the way was not $100. And it was going to bring computers to everybody. Right? So long story short, one laptop per child completely failed. And in the meantime, Chinese companies were building smartphones for 80 bucks that had more power. So we have to ask some real questions about what's going on, right? And not sort of think that the good intentions of work lead to the best possible outcomes. We have to understand the bigger picture here. And it's a complex picture because social change is hard, business building is hard, and frankly, trends change. Markets move, things happen all the time. So I was looking at Unleashed, which is the tech platform that I built, as a way to unleash people's potential. So I called it Unleash. I spelled it with two E's because at the core was an experiential education, skill building process. And I focused my attention on doing that. And so I spun Unleash out into the real world as its own company, raised its own capital. And I learned another thing, which is, a good idea for the world does not necessarily have a market, right? So it's good and well to have these big grand ideas, but the reason most entrepreneurs fail, it turns out, is because they can't figure out product market fit. They can't figure out how to actually market their product to a willing buyer, right? And so we spun out Unleash and we started developing this but before long, as a traditional entrepreneur at this point, I was realizing that my investors and you know, just sheer cash needs were kind of pulling me into the lowest hanging fruit, right? What could I do to make this tech company successful? And I had built a network in international education and study abroad. And so the obvious solution was just sell to higher ed and study abroad. Right, basically just sell to the folks who you know so you can generate some cash, right? And what's so interesting is not the decisions that were made then, but the choices that we faced as an enterprise when we were struggling with, we wanna be a high impact scaled operation. 
but we want to be a viable business also. And by the way, generating recurring revenue that works with a happy customer is not so easy. So we had to kind of think through that and we went through this unbelievable journey kind of iterating and reiterating and actually it's been quite an extraordinary experience because life leads you in funny ways. So Unleash over the last four years did a lot of higher ed, did a lot of international education, still does by the way. But then we connected with an organization that um, brings 20,000 students from around the world to live and work in the United States on J-1 visas, which are short-term experiences where they get to work and travel around the U.S. Uh, these are like summer temporary gigs at amusement parks, restaurants, you know, hotels, that kind of stuff. And they loved Unleash. So I had them use Unleash to train and prepare these 20,000 folks for their experiences in the United States. And what happened after that, totally unexpected, because I was at the time trying to uh, you know, totally solve poverty in Africa, that's where I was focusing, a little bit in Latin America because we had a Panama office. But what happened was I started to look here and I started to focus domestically on what our, what our situation is here with our frontline workers, our retail workers, right? What happens with wage workers in America, right? And it started to bring up all these different questions of, you know, what's our impact? Who's the customer? What are we really out to do? And Unleash as a result, like a lot of enterprises, has gone through iterations and today's version is really a training platform for workforce development for frontline jobs, for store associates, for people in retail, for people who make between eight and $12 an hour, right? No benefits, often working multiple jobs. They turn over their jobs over 150%. A typical retail store sees 150% turnover. This is not a stable foundation for a society. And by the way, that reaches tens of millions of workers across the United States alone, right? So now I'm coming at it from a traditional for-profit lens, which is, okay, well, I need to now serve my customer, which is the business, and I also need to do something that's meaningful and impactful for the end user, which is the low-skilled, low-wage worker in a retail environment, right? Okay, I provide that context only to then throw a whole wrench in the system, okay? Did think impact, started doing Unleash, which had gone through years of iteration, and then I got involved with another organization called More Than Me, okay? And I was a board member of the organization uh, for, for many years. And the founder of that organization uh, ended up, uh, she ended up be, being a recognized time person of the year for fighting Ebola and got the ear of the Minister of Education um, in Liberia, which is where she was working. And she managed with the Minister of Education to launch a public-private program, a pro public-private partnership that would bring outside operators, for-profit or non-profit organizations, in to Liberia to run public schools, right? So it's sort of like a, kind of like a charter school network model for Liberia, but working with outside organizations, not necessarily, not necessarily Liberian. There were Liberian organizations. And as a board member looking at this program, I thought, okay, well, more than me has a role here. We helped catalyze this whole initiative. It's really, really cool. And it spoke to me on one level that I hadn't really been exercising for a while, which was public policy. It spoke to my background in policy, and I was really interested to understand what this would look like and to work with government on potentially scalable impact, right? This is that thing again, scale. So, I ended up writing a strategy for more than me on what they would do in public schools, right? Taking their existing model and modifying it in a low cost environment. And then I joined the organization as president and I served for a little over two years in that role, helping them grow from one private girls academy to then 19 public schools um, across Liberia. But the public private partnership is really what I wanna focus on. It, it, it was led by the Ministry of Education. It was philanthropically supported. And its focus was to bring in a lot of different constituencies really quickly. And so what they did is they brought in seven or eight outside operators, and they started by bringing those operators in to run 94 public schools. 
That then scaled to, in year two, 194 public schools, of which More Than Me runs 18. And that sparked an international debate that was way beyond my expectations. I mean, New York Times Magazine, Financial Times, Economist, many stories, just debating the merits of bringing in for-profit and non-profit, More Than Me is a non-profit, um, providers to run public schools. And it, the debate rages today. And one of the operators is a tech-based solution called Bridge International Academies, which has gotten a lot of media attention. Another one was a low-tech solution, uh, a UK for-profit called, for called Rising Academies. Then there were organizations like BRAC, which a lot of you have probably heard of, out of Bangladesh, which is a huge, it's the largest NGO in the world. And so, so you had this really interesting situation where there was philanthropy funding an initiative that the government was sanctioning and facilitating that was paying for-profit and non-profit social enterprises to improve education outcomes, right? And that program was at first called Partnership Schools for Liberia, and then there was an election and a new president was elected, and they, they made some tweaks to the program and rebranded it to be uh, LEAP, the Liberia Education Advancement Program, and it continues to this day. And today, LEAP is working on developing a social impact bond, which is where Gary and I started our conversation when we first met, to help fund this transformational program at scale and what that would really mean. So the reason I'm giving you all that context is because social entrepreneurship and public policy should talk all the time, right? They should be literally hanging out every day at lunch together, but they really aren't because social entrepreneurship is really about individual enterprises solving very acute needs somewhere, right? Which is important, right? It's a lot like any organization with an impact focused, for-profit, non-profit, community-based. Meanwhile, public policy is really being viewed in, in sort of multiple lenses. Um, one is regulatory and creating the rules for society, the rules of the road, but also Increasingly, especially when you think about international aid or when you think about the conversation today in American politics, it's almost being viewed as sort of philanthropist in chief, right? Like when you look at government, it's government should or shouldn't fund something, which is a different conversation. And that's not always in house, right? It's not like the government is running every program they're funding, right? So it brings, to, it brings to mind a lot of really important questions about the role of government. And frankly, the next piece is the role of philanthropy. So you start thinking about government as rules, large check writer, and then you start to think about other large check writers. And the other large check writers today are ultra high net worth individuals. And those ultra high net worth individuals have huge influence over public policy, right? So much, actually, it would astonish you. So if you look at the Gates Foundation, right? The Gates Foundation being the largest private foundation. They come out with a set of priorities. Think about what happens. They move entire organizations toward those priorities. So it's not a couple people. It's hundreds of thousands of people mobilizing immediately to meet the direction of one funding body. Sound a lot like at USAID. So what happens is you end up with a global environment where there are governments which are not getting the attention around the rulemaking that maybe they should be. You have an environment where ultra high net worth philanthropy is stepping up to take action. And frankly, they're unelected. So they're taking Microsoft dollars or Apple dollars or whatever dollars, and they're deploying them based on whatever the advisors tell them is the most strategic, highest impact thing to do. It's pretty complicated. Meanwhile, there are the entrepreneurs and the nonprofits that have been around for a long time that are, number one, trying to pay the bills, and number two, two trying to make a big impact that are committed to these ideas, right? So the reason I brought up the Gates Foundation is because they, they had a really clear focus on global health right? Humongous attention. I mean, 
So much so, and so big is their influence, by the way, not only did they make global health their number one priority, which is a totally valuable priority. I'm really glad they did that. I think they've made a lot of impact. But so influential that when they do their annual report, at this point, if you read the really long letter that Bill and Melinda Gates write every year, they don't report on their work. They report on the data from the world. They actually report, you know, this is where the world is. This is how we know we're making an impact. That's insane. That is completely crazy when you think about the scale. It's happening over and over again, right? So you see it with the Walton Family Foundation funding charter schools. You see it with the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. You're seeing large bodies of philanthropy that are large funds of philanthropy that are making really big decisions for the future. And they're doing it with a lot of enthusiasm towards social entrepreneurship, which is great because social entrepreneurs do really important work, but it leaves out part of the picture, right? So what I wanted to do was throw up a first draft of a concept and have you guys rip it apart. So I'm, I tried, what I tried to do for this conversation was take all of this random stuff out of my mouth and turn it into a model that would explain the decisions that entrepreneurs make every day and how public policy might influence those decisions. Should we give it a try? Sure. You guys should speak up. Should we give it a try? Yeah. Let's get excited, yeah. you know? This is, a, this is an exciting thing to build a, a graph in front of people. Um, okay, so what I, what I think number one is really important, and, and I, I say this without any disrespect because I still run a social enterprise and I believe deeply in the important work that individual organizations make. I do believe, however, that the idea of a double bottom line that you can have impact and profit at the same time, at the same level, is false. I don't believe it, right? And the reason I don't believe it is because people get up every day, go to work, and make choices. And when you're making choices, you're always gonna see trade-offs, right? When you decide to go to USC for college, you're deciding that against an alternative scenario, right? Both can be great. No, no trade-off, no decision means that the trade-off was a bad trade-off, but it does mean that you're making a choice. And social entrepreneurs have to make choices like everybody else, right? So I'm gonna start with that. But nothing's absolute, right? Because I've given you this whole like complex picture of everything that I've been involved with. And so I can say that literally nothing is absolute. So what I've done is I've put as sort of like the major metric that we're all interested in is value creation, right? When you talk to, you know, it's, it's not the language of public policy, but when you talk to entrepreneurs, creating value means making money. When you talk to social entrepreneurs or impact entrepreneurs or nonprofit entrepreneurs or, or leaders, it's value creation is making an impact, right? And in public policy, value creation is improving people's quality of life, right? That is value, right? What is valuable, making more of what is valuable, right? So that's value creation. That's my, that's my Y axis, okay? Then on my X axis, I have, and I've been playing with this, and this is really a draft. So don't feel bad if you're like, that is so dumb. I will not mind. On the X axis is financial incentive, incentive okay? Right? And so people, organizations, and by the way, when I think about this model, I think about this as enterprise level. This is the firm making decisions. This isn't the country. This isn't, the, this isn't individuals. This is the choices that an organization faces. Okay? So we're following. And I, by the way, I call this the title. It's called the enterprise. Impact decision curve, okay? So, okay, 
everybody wants to create value. Everybody has different levels of financial incentive, different motivation to be rich, okay? So then, if we think about what the double bottom line is really about, right? True double bottom line. It's as if we have a line right there in the middle that on the one side has profit, or I'll do a little PR, and on the other side has impact, okay? And I have terrible handwriting, so nothing I write up here is gonna be legible to anybody but me. So the double bottom line actually calls for value creation to be equal for impact and for profit, right? But here's the thing, in the real world, there's what I call the decision-making threshold, okay? Where you decide if you're gonna weigh a choice for the profit potential or the impact potential. Fair enough? And what everybody wants is for organizations to always, for social enterprises, not all organizations, for social enterprises, to always make a choice right there, okay? Which is right at that threshold, balancing beautifully impact and profit, right? But I like to call that the impossible balance, okay? So think about this not as a, not as a dot on the line. This isn't economics, though this is kind of economics. I'm not drawing a supply and demand chart. This isn't a dot on the line. This is actually a little fulcrum point. This is something that this, this board, this line teeters on. This is a, uh, a lever, essentially. This is a, a balancing point. This is the impossible balance, okay? Now, what you see, if you draw it out a little bit further, which I'm gonna do in different colors. Thank you, Stacia, for the colors. Um, is it's also possible to have an organization that has high profit incentive and low impact but that decision point is over here. It's pushing up that line. And what's happening here is this is where org decisions are being made. This is where org strategy lives. So organizations are making their strategic decisions right here with a clear motive for profit, right? And in a pure nonprofit environment, You'll, and they have to be mindful of like certain impact in the world. They can't just go and destroy every forest and every waterway because that's going to be bad for marketing. So there's some amount of impact factored in. Nobody's all the way to the end. Those people end up in jail. And then on the other side, there's sort of the impact crowd. And that's the pure nonprofit, right? And they're thinking, OK, we can create all our value on the impact side, and we're going to be not financially motivated, but we have to be a little financially motivated because we can't pay the bills if we're not a little financially motivated, right? So this is like this basic drawing. This is the basic draft of how organizations make decisions. Now, I don't have a ton of time, but what I wanted to do, and, and I've got um, a bunch of different things, but what I wanted to do with you was Explore the idea that public policy and philanthropy and impact investing, which I haven't even gotten into, which is a whole other conversation around social enterprise and the expectation of the double bottom line, which is preposterous. What I, what I wanted to do was talk about how those external influences affect individual enterprises' decision making. Right? So if you think about it, if your public policy right, is to make sure to increase impact, so if we're taking, the, if we're taking a view of um, the LEAP program in Liberia, right? in that program, they were building a, an incentive structure for businesses to come to Liberia to build 
to, to build or operate schools, okay, and to improve people's education. And there's some toggle where Liberia was on this graph, and I'll redraw it for a sec. And then I, I want you guys to riff with me here. But let's say you have, you have this, you have this. Liberia's education sector, the, the organizations operating in the Liberian education sector, were not getting great ac academic results, so really terrible impact, and were broke, really little money, right? So the pre-leap line was like that, and people were probably looking to just pay their bills a little more than they were even trying to make an impact, if we're being honest, because they can't stay in business if they're not doing anything to bring in some dollars, right? That's where the line was. When Leap came in, right, and started to incentivize outside operators, they did something. They changed the game. They shifted the curve. So they pushed the education sector up. And then this is where the real debate comes in for how, and this is down to the individual organization. Each organization has its own line, right? So maybe one organization, and if you think about a uh, for-profit enterprise that wants to go public, their incentive to identify profit is gonna maybe push up a little higher. So their incentive, and their incentive for impact is gonna go up. There's gonna be more money to make more impact to reach more kids, but maybe it won't keep pace with that individual organization. So what happens is one organization is incentivized like that, right? And then another nonprofit organization like More Than Me comes in, and we're actually happy to subsidize times two. So for every dollar we get paid to run these programs, we'll throw another dollar at it. So we have to raise money, we have to stay in business, but we're really focused on sort of the impact. So what happens is, let's say, I'm gonna go ahead and give us a little extra credit, because we're awesome, and say that we're making a little bit more impact and our financial incentive is sort of there, right? What happens with public policy, and when you're thinking about public policy with respect to the enterprise, is you take a ton of what different scenarios would have from a lot of enterprises, and you figure out what the average is, right? Where is this gonna land? What's the influence on policy gonna be? And I think the argument for the Liberian Education Advancement Program, and then the Social Impact Bond, and so on and so forth, was simply to shift this red line up at all. Let's use money, right? The argument was, let's use the financial incentive of paying outside operators so that we can raise the bar on impact. Because impact is way too low, right? And so, Discuss. What what makes sense? Yeah. If there was more money to give to outside people, um, then why didn't they invest that more money that they had in the system that they have? Okay, so two parts to that answer. The first is they didn't have any money. So all of the money was raised philanthropically. And philanthropists in that case were motivated by a public private partnership that was innovative because there's a lot of interest in innovative solutions to old problems. And quite frankly, and no, no disrespect to the Liberian Ministry of Education, but their system is totally broken. So you can throw $100 million at that system and probably get no results. Yeah. And what you just described is their system being broken. And how much of that is the result of no money? You know, it's, it's a result of a lot of things. So the real reason the Liberian education system is broken is civil war, right? So if you go back, there was a 14-year civil war which essentially gutted a generation of learning, right? And that's the same kind of problem that I saw in South Africa going back a decade and a half. So the reason, you can't educate a society with money if there aren't educators and there isn't content and material. So you have to start going real, you have to get real with the problem. And the question was, who's going to build that capacity, right? So, I mean, th there's a terrible joke, well, there's a terrible saying in Liberia, which is, if you want to hide something from a Liberian, put it in writing, okay? That's because the literacy rates are so high. So the problem is that 
you're dealing with a very difficult environment. And in this case, public policy called for bringing outsiders, which is controversial, admittedly, to help move that needle. Um, the other thing is, and, and actually in that book I mentioned before, my biggest critique of the book is that, again, and this goes back to sort of a form of philanthropy, is when we reduce every solution to more money. Most entrepreneurs, I didn't start here and say that entrepreneurs fail because they don't have money. Entrepreneurs fail because they don't go to market effectively. Programs don't fail, or governments don't fail because they don't have money. Governments fail because they have poor policies, because they don't have stability, because they have a lot of other things, but not just because they're not writing big checks, right? And I'm pretty liberal, and I'm saying that out loud, right? Because the truth is, if you just infused, and, and they, they wanted to infuse money into a ministry, you get the same outcomes that you've been seeing from the development agencies for the last 60 years, which have been struggling. Any other, thanks for the question, any other analysis or disagreements, particularly disagreements, things that don't make sense is welcome? Yep, the impossible balance. Well, I think what you have to do is you have to be, and, and this is the point of this, right, is we have to be more aware, right? So we have to be okay with the trade-offs, and we have to stop having a false conversation about a binary world, right? So today we look at the world and we're like, that's a good organization or a bad organization. That's an organization that does a lot of good work or doesn't care about people. And the truth is every day when we make decisions in an organization, we're somewhere on the line. Holding the balance is really impossible because frankly, sometimes you gotta let people go from the company to save the business, which is a financial decision, but it's really bad for all the people they were serving who maybe were beneficiaries that saw a lot of change in their lives. So there's always gonna be those choices. And I think what I'm trying to do here is say, let's have a more honest conversation about the role of the enterprise. And then let's start thinking about the bigger structures that are enabling enterprises to function and decide what we wanna do with that information. You had a question? Um, no, so I think, I think things that move the line are philanthropy, the impact, like here, here's an interesting one. The impact investing world is like, and the latest data is that there's $23 trillion of untapped impact money. I don't believe that for one second, but that's what people are saying now. $23 trillion that can be mobilized to get it a double bottom line. Right. What happens is when impact investors get in the game and they're increasingly looking like venture capitalists who are increasingly looking like Wall Street bankers, right? They're becoming professionalized, formalized, and sharky, frankly. What happens is you have people whose money is on the line and the question is, I wanna make an impact. Basically, I don't wanna feel bad about my money. I don't wanna fund fossil fuel anymore, but I don't want to sacrifice any of my return on investment. I don't want to see my market rate return go down to 3% because I'm making a bigger impact. I want to make a big impact, but let's do it without sacrificing returns, right? That's the conversation. And so what happens is different players, and I'm using, I'm using the impact investment example as one, because what it does is it puts different pressure on different parts of the line, okay? So if you have the line and it's right here and it's, this is the impact space. It's more motivated, the decisions are geared towards impact, right? And then impact investors get involved. Okay, they can infuse cash, add capacity, and most importantly, incentivize more people to get in the game. It shifts the curve up. But what it might be doing is shifting the curve up a little further on the profit side than on the impact side, right? And that's gonna happen because, by the way, financial incentives, really, really powerful. Right? They become more powerful over time the older you get. Right? So this is, this is something that I just really want the sector to be having a real conversation about. Now, here's one thing, one caveat I'll put. This is not every impact 
investor, right? This is not every philanthropist. Some philanthropists are pure profit and have no mind for sustainability, and I think that's really problematic too, right? But what you do find is different kinds of impact investors. So I've worked with nonprofit foundation impact investors who are really not actually interested in a return on investment. They're actually excited to recuperate their investment because if they make back the $100,000 they put in, they can recycle that money and that's a win. They don't need to make 10% per year to feel good. That's awesome. I actually think the highest impact, impact investing is probably coming out of donor advised funds and foundations, right? Because their return expectations are different, right? But once you're putting on an, a market rate return expectation with an impact lens, you're creating a really complicated picture that I think anybody who tells you that you can absolutely meet the double bottom line is oversimplifying some, you know, the case significantly. So, given that proposition, I sense that there's no easy way to do an apples and apples comparison. You know, financial returns, you can do that afterwards. You can do it using phone to do it. Sure. When you go to the other side of the street and try to have this conversation about what's impactful and how you measure it, it is not really right. Yeah, so, so that's, that's right. And one of the things that <clears throat> has happened in the space over the last 10 years is people are really passionate about metrics. Impact measurements, monitoring and evaluation, it's all about these measures. And the reality is, like, we don't really know causation, right? We have entire universities dedicated to understanding what causes and affects society. And so when we boil things down to an impact metric, we're gonna go for the impact metric that sort of makes us look most effective. And we're gonna kind of turn a blind eye to the other ones. And it isn't an apples to apples ever. And that's probably the driver. And thanks for the insight. That's probably why financial incentives are more powerful. Not because we're all a bunch of greedy people, but because it's easier. It's clear and people are motivated by clarity. I wanna to touch on one other idea and then I'll get to you guys. So the other thing that I've been thinking about, and this might be, I'm just floating this, is if enterprises are so highly motivated, like extremely highly motivated to get involved in impact, right? Both on the for-profit and non-profit side. So let's draw a curve like right up here where the individual enterprise is making a ton of impact and making good money, or even, even maybe a line that's more like that, a little less money. What that brings to mind is, and I, I think that we can look at, you know, this graph to me looks like, like the international development world in a nutshell. There's like really high impact work on an individual basis, but there's societal problems. The fact that the line has to be this high on the incentive side, the fact that companies are getting paid lots of money to deliver aid and these kinds of things, is probably a call that there really needs to be a policy shift. If the gap is huge and the impact being provided by individual enterprises is so high and they're so highly incentivized to be involved, there probably needs to be a reckoning with policy to remove the need altogether. It means we know how to make an impact and we're not doing it as a system, right? And so I, I would posit that if the space is too big, that means that there needs to be some policy. If the space is too low, I would say the same thing. If there are not enough people getting involved and are not addressing the issue, we need to start incentivizing it. You saw that with something like carbon trading, right? The environment, let's get companies involved, let's do carbon trading, car, you know, that carbon taxing, those were policies that started to move the needle on the climate change discussion. I'm not an expert in anything environmental, but I would posit that that would be an example of a shift. Going back there and then I'll go to you. Um, in regards to the impact, yeah. It's an awesome question. So obviously as a nonprofit, we were right up here. We used to limit, just to give you an example, thanks for coming guys. Yeah. Everybody's gotta go somewhere. Um, as a nonprofit, we were pretty high on the impact side. We even limited the number of participants that were allowed to try to make sure that we cherry pick the best students and put them in these environments to do the best work. And actually what's interesting is our impact probably grew after we went for profit. So I'll show you, like it's an evolution, right? So it's a snapshot. So to, if you look at the snapshot here, the, 
the Think Impact graph in 2008 or 9 was decisions were made primarily with impact in mind, and we wanted to be financially viable. Okay, so then. What happened was after we went for profit, our profit incentive went up. Actually, I, I think I'm giving myself too much credit. The line was probably more like there, okay? I mean, I think we were a young startup and our, our work wasn't necessarily that high impact. So I'm just gonna put that out there. And then what I think happened is it moved up. Our profit incentive went up, but so did our impact. So that change in structure was akin to a policy change, right? I changed the organization. The new entity probably looked, mm, I want to say it looked like that, but realistically, it probably looked more like that, almost at the impossible balance, and it was weighing impact. And what happened was I was making decisions with an impact lens, not with a market lens, and it nearly did the business in because I was like, We've got to stay true to the core program, eight weeks, full immersion, this, this, this. And there just wasn't a market for that. You couldn't grow the business. So we had to toggle. And so now the organization is quite different. I mean, I've sold the organization. There's a different sort of bigger company. But it's probably evolved to be more like that other blue line now. So it is a traditional enterprise with investors. And so it's actually made that shift. And it's been really interesting to see. And, th and then I want to get to you. Sorry. I guess a second part question. So do you suppose scaling is like an important essential component of being a social innovator or entrepreneur? No. I think scaling is great sometimes. Um, I think scaling is only great when you've found your line and you feel really, really confident that that line can be held as it is for a pretty long time. So scaling doesn't make any sense if that's moving. Because it's kind of like, how can you deliver something high quality at scale that has impact or financial returns if you're constantly changing the game? It's like franchising. You can't franchise a business that has crappy operations, right? That doesn't work well. You're going to lose a lot of money. So I think scale is really when that line is pretty fixed, it, even in the face of you know, changes in the economy, changes in the um, dynamics around the business. And once that line is fairly fixed, I think you can imagine scaling, if that makes sense. Yeah? I had two questions, and I think one might be pretty dumb. But the first Probably not. Okay. <laughs> well, you'll see. I'll let you know. Thank you. <laughs> the first one is um, about whether you have any concern that certain enterprises or sectors in society seem to always be held to this evaluation outcome and impact uh, criteria, where others, such as corrections, military, border enforcement, you just spend as much money as you want, and there's no, you don't even have to prove that you need it. It's just given. So that was my first question, whether you had concern about that. The second is maybe I'm being too literal, but you were talking about a curve. And I yeah, yeah, it's a line. Oh, OK. You know, it's like when, you know, think, I can, you know, Econ 101, they're like, this is the supply and demand curve. Okay. So I'm just riffing off of my, you know, freshman professor. <laughs> so it was a good question. A, I, I thought about it. I was like, but the, the enterprise impact demand line sounds really dumb. So I'm going to go with curve for now. But we might modify that. Um, so, so to your point, I actually think, I, I think it's a huge problem. I remember going back when I was in college, um, I, I brought speakers to campus, and one of the speakers was General Clark, right? And I asked him, when is defense spending, like, when is there too much defense spending? Like, we're spending, at that point, it was like, um, it, was, it was about a half a trillion dollars a year. It's more now, way more now. Um, but it had been $277 billion when Clinton left office, and I thought, okay, we're just spending and spending and spending. And I thought, I got the general right here. I'm going to ask him. And his answer was totally unsatisfactory to me. It was, you know, whatever you need, right? It was sort of like, and, and I think that's this, I wouldn't call that like anywhere near like the philanthropy thing. But you do realize that unconstrained situations are not necessarily more effective, right? So as a society, if we think money solves all problems, makes us more powerful in the world, stops illegal immigration, 
um, deals with criminals, we end up with some pretty adverse incentives. And that freaks me out, to be perfectly honest. We can't accept that as a society. So we need to be asking the same questions of the big items, like prisons and the military, as we do about the small items, which are being dealt with, by the way, on and small being important in individual lives, but not necessarily as systemic, um, that maybe social enterprises are tackling. At this point, you say money can do this. Actually, uh, I'm not supportive of this, but this idea. Instead of money, actually, dictatorship or authoritarian regime sure. can uh, uh, stop those things. But we are not really. In my uh, walking around, mm -hmm. you will see crime with the money. Right. And all the corruption, all the things. Although, although I would nuance that. So um, I once, one of my grad school professors said, you can actually see the corruption drop the further north you go, right? So when you're in Norway and Sweden, there's almost no corruption in the, in the upper reaches. And actually that's true, right? Norway has a trillion plus dollar sovereign wealth fund and they haven't squandered it. But you can look at Nigeria, which has had over 300, probably well over $300 billion vanish out of their oil markets. Okay, So the reason I'm saying that is Norway is a vibrant democracy. And Nigeria is a pretty hot, but still, vi like still live and vibrant democracy. And I think when you look at, yes, obviously benevolent, benevolent dictator, right, or philosopher king um, is nice, but we don't, we don't want to bet on that, right, because it usually doesn't work out well. Um, and so what we should be betting on is ourselves. And so we should be really deeply engaged in getting those structures right, just the way others have somewhere else in the world. So I want to ask one yeah. last question just to clarify for folks. Like sure. I may have heard you say two different things. One is you had kind of a narrow definition of what a social enterprise was, so focusing on a particular need or population, and so you create an enterprise to solve that problem. But then this model, one might interpret you saying because of this continuum that you're back to, well, everything's a social enterprise. Mm. Um, you're just somewhere on the continuum. You're not, you know, as long as you're not doing abject harm in your profit making activity. So I'd love for you to clarify that. Yeah, that's great. That's actually very helpful. Um, first of all, the way I think about this is this is the enterprise and it's working in an environment, right? So there's an ecosystem around it. And that's by topic. So there's an ecosystem around the environment. There's an ecosystem or an environment around incentives that encourage enterprises to act in different ways for criminal justice reform or what have you. Okay. So first, it's an ecosystem. It's an enterprise within an ecosystem. But to your point, I called it the enterprise impact decision making model because it's not necessarily a social driven enterprise. Goldman Sachs ought not call itself a social enterprise, but they have a line on the graph. So they're making a decision about impact as an organization, and then they're making a different decision about impact when it comes to their investment in 10,000 women and all these different things. But every organization is truly its own enterprise, and it just makes impact decisions. So I wouldn't call this a definition of social enterprise. So thanks for that. Well, thanks again for being with us today. Everyone. Thank you.